Welcome to the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy. And for this, our 50th episode, I want you to take note of Lee Scratch Perry, the upsetter. At 84 years young, he has enough laurels to rest on, but he still keeps creating. As a music producer, he arguably invented reggae in the late 1960s and early 70s. And he inarguably invented dub in the mid-1970s at his famed Black Ark studio in Jamaica. He was also Bob Marley's mentor, producing some of his first recordings. It's possible he also invented sampling, using the sound of a crying baby to begin his song People Funny Boy in 1968, a scathing rebuke against one of his rival producers. His musical influence is not limited to reggae either. He has collaborated with The Clash, The Beastie Boys, George Clinton, Keith Richards, and so many more. Oh, and one other thing about Lee Scratch Perry and the reputation that precedes him. Well, he sings a song called I Am a Madman, and a lot of people who have worked with him would definitely agree with that. The conversation you're about to hear takes a lot of twists and turns, and some of his answers were so different from the questions I asked that I was tempted to dub in, no pun intended, some alternate questions. What I decided to do instead is to interrupt every now and then and give you some context, so do not expect a traditional episode of the Music Is My Life podcast. I mean, is anything traditional anymore? For instance, when I ask him, you grew up with... What, four siblings? Yeah, we, I grew up with it. I have a revolution. <laughs> so, yeah, he grew up with a revolution. Oh, also, another thing to warn you about, this interview was done via WhatsApp, so the quality suffers a little. But if you go to online.berkeley.edu slash take note right now, you'll be able to read along with the transcript. Okay, back to the program. All right. I grew up with revolution in my brain. Revolution on my leg and revolution in my head. <laughs> Were there songs in your family bef- before you went off to Kingston, music that you liked? Well, I was a down. Um, <laughs> I went over like Charlie Brown, um, like pop music. Uh huh. Yeah, I was loving pop music and, um, Pick out those papers on the trash. Are you working or spending cash? So I was listening to pop music. I'm a lover of pop music. So that's how I think when my, my number one star is Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson? You've been recording for years by the time you'd heard him, right? Well, I love is that uncommon, right? And me is a pop music lover. And uh, I even love hip hop music. Mm-hmm. Yeah? I, I love hip hop music even more than reggae music, and reggae music is okay. So I love the American artists them so much because the American artists, they have super, very good vibes. <laughs> So I was always listening to good singers and love good singers and love real singers. So I was trying to be Bob Marley like in that in that reason before reggae becomes so common. So most of the charts that I have put in out was coming from the American singers. Yeah, that's all I mean. Yeah. So I mean to say if you want to hear about something like me love Jamaicans because they are my people, but their attitude are not too nice to me. I mean, I like ragamuffin. I mean, I like ragamuffin. And then me like special artists. James Brown was my friend. <laughs> James Brown? Yeah, my friend was my friend. Yeah. Uh, Rolling Stones are my friend, and I I don't like to see what will happen to the American, because most of the American singers, I, I learned from them, and I love them. And uh, 
I don't know what will happen, but I'm asking God to help the good singers in America to find a way out and to find freedom for the family and themselves. Because if, if all the American singers die, I would cry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, singers are our it last is, shot. It, it would be too boring without the American singers. Okay, here's the first interruption. So at this point, he is talking about how he'd be sad if all of the American singers died, because he's referring back to a theory that he revealed when our conversation first started, that the coronavirus is affecting America so badly now because the American government gave Bob Marley cancer. Are you following? So he's actually not the only person who believes the second part of this. Most biographers of Bob Marley will acknowledge that there was definitely a suspicious amount of interest the FBI had in the reggae superstar, and that the agency considered him a threat. Maybe he'd inspire a great uprising, maybe his songs were too political. And most biographers will acknowledge that, yes, there is at least some credible evidence that the American government had something to do with the 1978 assassination attempt against Bob Marley. But there is little credible evidence to support the theory that a device the American government had placed in Bob Marley's shoe caused the cancer that killed him in 1981. However, some people believe that. Lee Scratch Perry seems to be one of those people. And he also seems to believe that the virus is karmic retribution. Here's the clip from earlier in the discussion, complete with annoying phone notification on my end. Sorry about that. American scientists and American Obiaman and American this. Tell them give Bob Marley cancer in here. So I then give Bob Marley cancer and I could not find the answer. Why did they give Bob Marley cancer? If they didn't give Bob Marley cancer, then Bob Marley gave them virus. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I always wondered about that. There, there was that conspiracy that the government gave no, him Bob, cancer. Bob Marley was my student. Yeah. And he's my student. So the American government and the American scientists Give my children cancer. Me have to, me have to get, me have to find the answer and send, send back what they give. <laughs> so, what did the American government give to Bob Marley? It's cancer. But then he gave back something much more positive Correct. than cancer. So, so Bob, Mar so Bob Marley gave them a um, virus. Mm. It yeah, took it. <laughs> yeah I, I guess it took a while, but uh, I don't know. I mean, he, w you knew him well. W was he a vengeful person? No, he's not him doing it. He's in boss. He, his boss look at me and say, Look what they are going to our superstar. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so by Bob Marley's boss, he says he means Cyrus the Great from the Bible or Marcus Garvey. I tried to get the interview back on track and ask Lee Scratch Perry about his move from the country to Kingston, Jamaica, where he worked on building the first road to Negril in the 1950s. And he has said that hearing the rocks bashing against each other while he worked on the road created a great rhythm that inspired him to get involved in music. In his answer, you'll hear that he begins to talk about dub, the art form he invented as a producer, where he would make extended versions of songs people were already familiar with and drop out key components to focus on other portions of the song, like drum and bass. Okay, so let's see. When, when you do move to the city and, and you're working on, on construction and, and you start hearing the rhythm of the rocks, how, how, yeah. how did you start to go to, say, like, go to the recording studios to to make your mark that way? Well, when I listen to a good song, it turned me on. And it turned me on, then we want to make another version of it. Or make a copy of it. But not the original way like it is in different form. So most of the, um, the songs that me listening when the American 
American like TV Wonder and all those type of people. So then they could have an artist who want to say, why are you two so copy TV Wonder? We have an artist named David Isa. I really wanted to copy TV Wonder and it worked. Yeah. I said, and Tina Turner was my bubble. In America, Tina Turner. Mm-hmm. I remember hearing a story once about how reggae kind of happened because the way that you would pick up the radio stations in Jamaica, there were little gaps. And uh, and that's how people thought that that's the way the songs really were. Is there any truth to that? Most of the, most of the, most of the way the, the reggae come. We want to make sound system and, and something like that. And most of the melody was coming from from um, from America. Mm-hmm. So then we would put it with a separation as it happened, and build another version, or copy some American good song, and make it in another version. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So the American music, you call it pop music or whatever it was, and the funky music. We love the funky music. We love the American soul music. We love the funky music. We love the pop music. So we were going close to make another version of most of the American. We never make more version of, of English. Then we were going to make version of English. Then we would do the, the Beatles. <laughs> but, but we would do all the English. We never do the details and some of the rolling stone and something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, if the American see it out, it would hurt me very much too. Because most of my idea was to listen to a good American singer. Versus Slade General. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the same <laughs> cook. Temptation. Yeah. In a turn, and you know the rest about Marvin Gaye and all those people, you know. Mm-hmm. When when those people feel away, not good. <laughs> Maybe how they were living, if they were living right, so I wish God to help them and send me some more top American singers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, not much. We can't listen to the ragamuffin reggae and it, it don't reach me. He has me as a ragamuffin. Yeah, so you don't <laughs> listen to reggae anymore. Is that what you're saying? When we really hear a good rapper uh, talk something sensible, we listen to the ragamuffin. We're not in the ragamuffin business because the, the world don't sound good to me. Mm-hmm. When I put it together, raga muffin. Raga means nothing to me. Yeah. And muffin means nothing to me. Muffin could be something that smells very bad and very stink. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to love raga muffin, I prefer love me do do. I love raga muffin. Lily, I just want to tell you when you finish, don't hang up, bring the phone to me. I want to ask you something. Yeah. Okay. Another context break, that's Lee's wife and manager, Morel. The question she wants to ask is all about how Americans are dealing with the coronavirus and lockdown procedures, etc. Anyway, we do end up having that conversation, but it's probably too tangential for this episode. And when Lee Scratch Perry comes back, he continues to talk about what components of a song are essential to make it move him. So, um, me like cult. And then we believe in good cult. Mm-hmm. We believe in soul. We believe in soul music, soul singers, funky singers, pop singers, Michael Jackson. He's like a little baby to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking speaking of little babies, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Funny Boy. That was like one of the first samples ever in music. Where where did you get the sound of the crying baby? Well, me and a friend, me Andy, was working. He was working at JV. 
a radio, a Jamaica radio station. And um, he has uh, listened to a um, special thing that he may have wanted, like to commercialize. And he bring me a copy of, of that, that, day, that baby crying. Uh huh. So um, it was on a record. And then we take it and put it into, put the record into my track, into my track. Yeah, <laughs> that's brilliant. You, you so change the world. Right. Right. Because the baby, without a baby, nothing can go on. Baby are the future. And my next choice in music, in art, artists now that goes on in Jamaica, Vibe Cartel is the top and the very best. At this point, Lee Scratch Perry goes on to talk about Vibes Cartel, the Jamaican dance hall musician who is currently in prison and won't be eligible for parole until 2046, but he's still releasing music. I'm not including that part of the conversation because I have to admit I had only a vague idea of who Vibes Cartel was until we talked about him. So that part of the conversation is just Lee Scratch Perry filling me in. He actually comes back to Vibes Cartel later in the conversation. So then I wanted to steer the conversation back to his own history and how he worked his way up from helping out in the studios of other Jamaican producers in the 1960s to building his own studio, the legendary Black Ark, in the 1970s. So then, basically, you started uh, the Black Ark after, you know, interning, basically, and working as a janitor at all these other studios. Were the other producers upset that you finally struck out on your own and were doing better than they were? Coxon, Duke Reed. Yep, Duke Reed. Yeah, the, the Duke. <laughs> Duke. And then Prince yeah. Buster, right? And Prince Buster, right. Yeah. After those people, that was at the business. It had different sets of people come up in the business. Then uh, the dreads um, want to take over and try to take over. So all the all dread Bob Marley become the best. <laughs> yeah, he did become the best dread. Yeah, because uh, his songs are uh, perfect. The way he composed them and the story he had behind it. I wanted to ask you a little bit about working with him in the day and just things like, well, you know, you take a song like Vampire and that becomes Mr. Brown. Do, do you remember recording Vampire originally? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. You've recorded so many so many things. I don't know how much memory you have for each individual track. Do you, do you remember them all well? Not really. Sometimes you have a great thing. It's like a movie going on in, in the brain. Mm-hmm. And then he liked me, me like him, he was like a brother to me. We made me feel. Right? Mm-hmm. Otherwise, otherwise, um, you have two spirits in this world. That one, the world, one is the devil. <laughs> one is Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> we spend the money. We really treat him and we really treat his family. So he was half white and half black. He was 100% black and he was not 100% white. <laughs> he was a good story and a good family, you know. So we get in the mix. <laughs> yeah, the mix. It's all about the mix. Yeah, we just have to mix it. Yeah, the part of this is you take Coke? I don't take Coke, no. All right. So you have another people who take Coke. And those people who take Coke, they are the devil. <laughs> yeah, makes you a different person, for sure. Two different people. Yeah. Well, me, me never take another the Coke. Mm-hmm. When we were working with, with Bob, and he wasn't taking no coke. He was living with me, and when we were living with me, he would, he would get a chance to take no coke in my house. Mm-hmm. But away from me, the, the coke, and maybe because he was sick, he must take the coke, I don't know. But he really is like a kid. Interesting. Yes. Bob is a special kid. 
Yeah, what was I mean, you mentioned Coke. What what was were people it, people using things stronger than ganja then? Yeah, yeah different things from ganja is the drugs that let you go to take you on a different trip. Yeah. <laughs> you feel you can make you can, you can fly something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think make you feel you can die. Yeah. Different kind of drugs. So I didn't care what you said. You can't make your own vex. You can't feel you couldn't die. Maybe you can take too much of the coke. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's a super joke. <laughs> anyhow, you never get technical with me. All those songs that me and me put together, they were spiritual dreams. Spiritual dream that I got and spiritual dream that he get. So I put his dream with mine together. And even more time to play like I was Bob Marley, so the call the song that him sings, it makes you feel like you are to sing them too. Yeah. So it was something special. Yeah, certainly. But it doesn't then you know, or even this this other guy um Vital is not in in, in that spiritual section with Bob, but people love him actually see him. We need to investigate if I know how much people love him. Yeah. And um, but he do a kind of different music, and everything he do it fit him. And I mean, artists like those, we love them. You understand? Yeah, they don't come along that often. I just special way to love Bob because Bob was half white, half black. They were picking up two, two spiritual vibrations, one white, one black, and put them all together. <laughs> yeah. Black, black and white. Yeah. So you find special artists. You open a lot of special artists in Jamaica, you know. So we, we talked a little bit about Vampire or Mr. Brown. And and yeah. you you don't, do you, you never, while at the Black Ark, you weren't actually playing instruments, right? You were just telling the musicians to humming the parts for them to play. Is that right? Yeah, but I'm on my job. They tell me, shall we want a bridge, shall we don't want a bridge? Or instead of the song going straight, let's make a bridge to make it sound different. We go on this bridge to somewhere. Mm-hmm. And after, after we go to somewhere on the bridge, they were going to come back to the bridge. So they were like, and they shout, to the bridge. Yeah, yeah. Over the bridge. And after they go over the bridge, you go and tell you make it one track. I never make one uh, one straight track. It, when you have bridging, the songs run better. And most of the artists don't understand how to make bridge. So doing a song like that, would would you say just like just play this? Yeah. You know, just on is that a synth or a moog or what the heck is that thing? Well, it sounds power and sounds correct. <laughs> sounds power. Magic cult and something like that. Yeah. You know, Marilyn was with each one, magic one. So now you're going to the bridge. Be careful. Either you go over the bridge or go out of the bridge, but now go into the bridge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm also interested in knowing, because, you know, people would always say you played the mixing console as an instrument. And, and it, it, there, there was a lot about your uh, energy. and how many From the mind. what's that? It it plays in the brain. It plays in the brain. In the, in the, yeah, in the brain. Then you you are be the pilot in the brain. Try be the pilot in the brain. And say the driver when to go over the bridge or when you go under the bridge and say most of go into the wood and cause an explosion. Mm-hmm. So uh, as, I save the boom, save the plane, and save the people and the tools flying on the plane. Yeah, so what what I'm wondering, though, is even just talking to you now, you have so many flights of thought, but listening to the music, some of it is so focused. Uh, would, you, right. would you ever spend, like, days and days on a single song, or would you just uh, get it done as quickly as possible and move on to another? No, I, I want to finish the, the, 
the, the song like each song is a dream. So if you want to tell a good story, you have to make the first dream PH one, mm-hmm. second dream PH two, third dream third page, and you have to make sure it's good that people can say, well, turn it over and give me another page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe page three, page four, page five. So sometimes that will be made the record that you turn the first one might be boring a little. Then the first one do you what happened next. So you turn page one over and turn over to page two to you what happened next. I want to make him love it and say, well, if I love this so much, then the third page will be better. Mm. <laughs> okay? That's the, way, that's the way I do it in my mind as a painter. I'm a painter too, you know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess that's the thing, is wondering when, how you know when a work of art, whether it's painting or a song, when it's done, when it's ready for the world... Well, you can say I I, I was a I was a painter and I started to paint, but I did not know how to paint. Then I decided to find out how to paint, and the spirit said to me, "Go find yourself and um, like a manager or an advisor. You can learn how to paint from the advisor." I advise I could teach you to management, a master painter, and you're going to learn how to a master painter. She has a master painter, like, how are the salary? So I dimension where you say, I'll take you there. I'll take you there on my airplane. And I'll let you know when you are going to hit the enemy. Now you know we are to rush a way to flash the paintbrush. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about dub. Just in the simplest terms, how how did you first think, like, all right, you know, I'm going to just take this track I recorded and make it a totally different song out of it? Well, if you go into to the power of the, of the drum is clap on. Clap on. You can clap on it. Two different dimensions, clap, 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 uh, clap, pack up, pack up, clap, pack up, pack up, clap, 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 at this point, he gets a little bit more graphic about how music relates to sex. So if you're sensitive to that sort of thing, you might want to skip ahead 20 seconds. You read Pum Pum, and the ladies have the Pum Pum. Then, so after you scratch the lady, Pum Pum, 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 Yes, and you whack it, and you whack the Pum Pum. You want to whack it, you jam the Pum Pum. Boom, 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 waka, waka, waka. Boom, 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 yaka, yaka, yaka. Boom, boom, boom. And yeah, you use the guitar now to do yaka yaka. Yeah, the guitar. Paka, paka, paka. Chaka, chaka, chaka. All right, another context break. So then I tried to steer him away from that a little bit, and I asked him about his legacy, which didn't exactly get him off the topic of sex. What what did you think? What what are you most proud of as you, as your contribution to music in general? Stiff wood, tough wood, strong wood, hard wood, and dead wood. Leave a stiff cock. <laughs> cock in the rest. You can't leave a rest of our right. Right. Tough cock. Rest of our right. Okay. I guess so. I pr- I probably won't be able to use that because. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um What's the party? So they man them here the world and think of them. But is the cop you rest the cool. No, I wasn't. What's the party? 
No, I wasn't asking about that as much as this, uh, the music. Uh, I remember hearing a quote from you saying, you know, what else can make you happy but music? So t- tell me just a little bit about that. There is nothing else. We got the music, if people get music, a revelation and the cast revolution. Because not necessarily make people happy. And you know, one thing that you make people happy, you are the happy. Yeah, if you can stop that, people will give me a life for it. But you know, fight against the people who love music. Anybody do that stupid. Music means to me, the God of thunder, the God of rain, the God of destruction, the God of obstruction, and the God of destruction. And all human beings can stop music. No human king can stop music. No human queen can stop music. And no human dream can stop music. And music means to me magic. Merlin, the great magic master. World thunder. Flash lightning. Send the rain. Here's stone, bring stone on fire. And open all the locks. Open dreadlocks, open naughty locks, open government locks, open tax locks. And then we want to find a little more room to pay no more tax. And to cramp and paralyze government, cramp and paralyze soldiers, cramp and paralyze vampires. In the name of God, Marilyn, the great music magic master. Merlin, the great music magic master, and Lee Scratch Perry, the great music magic master. Hey, if you want to become a great music magic master, one thing that could certainly be helpful in attaining that is taking a course with Berkeley Online. And because you listen to this podcast, if you've never taken a course with Berkeley Online before, you can get $100 off any course right now. All you got to do is visit musicismylifepod.com. Do it. This episode was edited by Talia Smith, mastered painstakingly by Jose David Vindas Mora, transcribed just as painstakingly by Ashley Pointer. All visual assets coordinated by Mike De Benedictus, social media by Brooke Larson, web assistance courtesy of Mark Thomas, Steve Zimmerman, and Joe McDonough. I wrote and recorded the Music Is My Life theme song, but the expert remixing comes courtesy of Lily Dickinson. Special thanks to Gabriel Reifer Cohen, Morel Perry, Clint Weiler, and John Palmer for so diligently working to make this interview happen. And thanks to you for listening. Be sure to listen on November 23rd when our guest will be Gavin Rosdale of the band Bush. Stay safe and stay inspired. We'll talk soon. Have a good time. Enjoy yourself. Bye-bye.